The next very important part of the talk that we're going to do today is classifying these infectious diseases. So communicable disease. These are diseases that can be spread from one host to another, either directly or indirectly. Chickenpox, measles, influenza. Mm -hmm. Contagious diseases are diseases that are easily or rapidly spread from one host to another. So there is a scale in which um, contagious diseases can move or are rated. We call these the R0 or the reproductive value. So if your reproductive value is high, that means the disease more easily moves within the population. So these reproductive values are calculated based on outbreaks. So the numbers range quite significantly because you could have one outbreak saying this is what the estimated reproductive number is. You can have another outbreak saying this is what the estimated reproductive number is. So for example, measles can be as high as 19. For the reproductive number. Again, one person can spread to 19 people, right? Where So it's a very contagious disease. Where when you have something like um, HIV or Ebola generally is not as contagious because it spreads, their reproductive number is one or two. Um, and in some situations, their reproductive number has been quite higher. Uh, but that's outbreak specific based on the community. Then you have non-communicable diseases. So these are diseases that uh, you kind of picked up from an outside source, but you can't give to anybody else. So Legionella is an excellent example. And I know it has tetanus on the board here, but Legionella is another excellent example. That is a form of pneumonia that you get from stagnant water that has been aerosolized through an air conditioner, a vent, a fountain, a shower head, a faucet, uh, something of that nature. And then you get the pneumonia. Well, you can't spread that pneumonia. It is a, it is not a, it is a non-contagious, non-communicable pneumonia. You can only get it from the environmental site. So, how do we define these things? Well, we define them in terms of incidence and prevalence. Incidence is the number of new cases or the number of people that get the disease over a particular time. So let's talk about that. Incidence is really good for acute diseases. So you want to count how many people are getting pneumonia because you recover from pneumonia in five or six days. So a person can get reinfected with an, uh, I'm sorry, not pneumonia, influenza. People can get reinfected with influenza every year, right? And so we're going to count them as a new incident case every year. On the other side, let's talk about chlamydia. Let's say in September, you get chlamydia. You get treated in September, and then you come back in December, you get chlamydia again. Well, you've been treated already and cured, and then you got it again. So that counts as two incidences of chlamydia. Now, if you remained untreated from September to December, then that is one case of chlamydia. So appropriate documentation of treatment is very important. Now, prevalence is just the total number of, count, uh, of cases. So prevalence is just saying, how many total cases are we dealing with with this disease? Now, prevalence is really good indicator for those chronic diseases. So a few examples of infectious diseases that are chronic are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. These are diseases that people have generally for a very long period of time. So whereas with incidence, it's the number of new cases each year, whereas prevalence is how big is our population pool growing? Now, one common example with incidence and prevalence has been a waterfall. So as you can see here, this is our waterfall. The incident cases are the new cases coming down, the water coming down, and the existing cases are found within this lake. Now, the only way that you get out of this prevalent calculation is if you die, or you recover, or you leave the area in which we are counting your case. So let me give you an example with HIV. 
HIV, up until this point, there are no recoveries. Okay, so the only way that you remove from the prevalence pool is if you die. However, but what does this mean? Out migrants. So let's say that I'm performing HIV surveillance for Fresno County and you live within Fresno County. Um, if you leave Fresno County, you will no longer appear in my numbers as people within Fresno County living with HIV. So if you die or you leave Fresno County, the prevalence numbers are going to go down. Now, that example is very important because that's going to be a short answer question on our next exam. Describe incidence and prevalence. And one other very interesting thing is the shorter the duration of the disease, so if it only lasts a week, prevalence will equal incidence. I know that's a very confusing thing, but think about it. If I want to know how many people had flu last month, I'm just going to count new flu cases because there is no such thing as chronic influenza. So the prevalence, therefore, is the incidence because the recovery is so quick. So we have several classifications. Sporadic diseases are diseases that don't occur often, okay? So these are diseases like salmonella typhi. Here in the United States, salmonella typhi is sporadic. Here in Fresno County, we get one to four cases of salmonella typhi per year. But if we went to a place like India, where salmonella typhi is endemic, which means the disease is constantly present in the population. Fresno County is quite famous for our STDs. So chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV are endemic. That means they are constantly here, constantly occurring. Now, epidemic is a little bit different. So epidemic is an increase, a very high increase in diseases over a short period of time. So let me give you an example with pertussis. So what you're seeing here is Fresno County Department of Public Health's annual 2014 report. What you're looking at is the incidence, so annual incidence rate of pertussis. And again, the reason why we're reporting on incidence for pertussis is because pertussis is treatable and it is acute, which means it's over very quickly. So we can see in 2006, we had an epidemic of pertussis, okay? In 2007, 2008, and 2009, we did have cases, but they were endemic, okay? And then in 2010, we had an epidemic. Then again, 2011, 12, and 13, just smaller levels of endemic cases and then we see an outbreak again in 2014. Now, when we juxtapose that to hepatitis B, hepatitis B is not epidemic, it's just endemic. Notice no peaks, no changes, you just have very quiet background levels of illness, okay? That is persistent. So that is endemic, and this is epidemic. Part of the reason of this epidemic jump is the weakness of the acellular pertussis vaccine. The old whole cell pertussis vaccine used to give protection for five to seven years. However, this new acellular pertussis vaccine, slightly weaker. And so what we notice is protection starts dropping off after two years. So in epidemiology, we refer to this as a cyclic trend. That means every two, three, four, or five years, you have epidemics of a disease based on the number in the population becoming susceptible or new people entering the population that are unvaccinated. All right, so that's epidemic and endemic. Pandemic, basically those higher elevated levels of disease 
worldwide. Now, outbreaks occur when you have in a specific, usually a school, um, maybe a class reunion, an occupation, a job site, uh, you have linked cases of the same disease where you have one person bringing it into a community and then it's spreading. So those are localized epidemics, right? So we call those outbreaks. Now there's one term that is not mentioned in this example, and that is hollow endemic. And hollow endemic means, and it really only applies to uh, malaria in Africa, everybody is assumed to have parasite in their blood. Okay, so that's how high it has to be to hollow endemic. Hollow endemic, again, not really concerned with you knowing and understanding the full gist of that. So this is reported um, HIV AIDS in the United States. And this hints at uh, a very important distinction. So prior to this year here, uh, we had a very limited definition of what we counted as HIV. So some of you are probably saying, well, what do you mean? Well, you have to have a case definition that says what labs are required, right? Uh, to determine if something is a case of a specific disease, what clinical symptoms are present, and who notified those symptoms and were they reported? So. As we look at 1993, there was an expansion of the case definition, and there was also a requirement of people um, having their names associated with their test. So while it looks like there is a jump in the number of cases of HIV, there's not. There was a change in the reporting requirement that required uh, people to report with names. So some of these people from the early 90s or the 80s would be re-reported and counted as new incidence cases, even though they had been counted previously because they were counted previously anonymously. And so now they are effectively recounted and you see an artificial spike. So anytime there's a change in a case definition or a disease becomes mandated <coughs> as reportable, it's going to look like there's an outbreak or an epidemic when there's not. It was just the bureaucracy of changing the numbers. All right, so what is the severity of the disease? We already discussed this. Short, acute influenza, you're gonna have things that last days, weeks, even with pertussis, a few months. Whereas chronic diseases, which will go on in perpetuity until they're treated or until the host is dead, which is things like infectious mononucleosis, hepatitis B, and tuberculosis. Subacute diseases, these are um, in, um, intermediate between acute and chronic, uh, and they can occur for uh, slightly longer, so a little bit more than um, a few months and not the duration of the patient's lifetime. So undulant fever, which we talked about previously, brucellosis, uh, which again has come from uh, unpasteurized uh, dairy products, cheeses, things of that nature. Uh, the disease will ramp up, slightly give you a fever and fatigue, and then go away. And it will continue to do that for several years if left untreated. Latent disease. The causative agent is inactive for a time, but then activates. Shingles is kind of the classic example here. You get chickenpox as a kid, or you get vaccinated for chickenpox, and then later in life, you have a sequelae or what we call uh, reactivation of latent disease, in which uh, the disease crops up again, you get a rash. For people that are exposed to tuberculosis but don't get active TB, they get something called latent tuberculosis infection, which means the organism is in them. It's not causing them disease. Their body is capable of suppressing infection, uh, but later in life, when their immune system function drops, then that latent tuberculosis becomes active. And then we have herd immunity. Herd immunity is trying to get a bunch of people vaccinated to prevent the disease from being communicated from person to person. So 